Let's do it. Yeah. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. Main man. I was once described as the manager, the mentor, and the visionary who went to the theater with an unfocused dilettante and raised the curtain on a superstar. Hello and welcome to episode 30 in our series exploring the history of the management rights company Mainman, which was renowned in the 70s for transforming the business of rock and roll. While allowing Mainman artists to explore their creative freedom, the company pioneered promotion and marketing techniques that became synonymous with the decadence, extravagance and indulgences that are now part of rock folklore. I was learning about how to play rhythm and blues, learning how to write everything that I read, every film that I saw, any bit of theatre, everything went into my mind as being an influence. And I wasn't quite sure how I was going to use any of these influences, but I knew that it, the stuff that I really liked, the books that I was reading from Kerouac to Christopher Isherwood, films that I saw like Dr Caligari's Cabinet, and even a stage musical at that time, Cabaret with Judi Dench. And I saw that in the lighting, the stage lighting was phenomenal because what I didn't know is that it was Brechtian lighting. It was just stark white light. And I'd never seen that before in my life. And that became a central image for me of what stage should look like. Main Man worked with a diverse range of clients that included Mick Ronson, Amanda Lear, John Mellencamp, Mop the Hoople, Dana Gillespie, Mick Ralphs, Iggy Pop, Cindy Bullens, David Bowie and Lou Reed. I mean, I really, you know, really like David. I really like Ronson. You know, that's kind of nice, don't you think? In the last episode, from the Main Man Archive, you heard Lee Black Childers, who was the assistant director of Andy Warhol's stage show Pork, which played Camden's Roundhouse in August 1971, which is how Lee came to meet Angie, David, Dana and DeFreeze, which eventually led to him being invited to join the Main Man team in America the following year. As you heard, Lee had some very interesting adventures as Main Man's American Vice President. In this episode, Tony DeFries shares his memories of Lee joining the team and some of the interesting situations he was required to deal with during his Main Man years. Once Lee had been appointed, if you like, as the second Main Man American staff member with as yet undetermined duties... Evidently, there was going to be some photography because we knew that's what he was doing. And that's as we hired him. He had been working for Sixteen Magazine, actually, as a photographer. But we still needed people to do some of the office-related things. Telephones and letter writing and typewriting and administrative stuff. Back in the UK, I had a marvellous bunch of people to do all of that in the GEM offices. One of them, of course, was Jane Hickey, an early, original, very together, competent girl. Public school, marvellous speaking voice, probably rode in. And then later on, another girl called Diane Mackey, who later became married to our one-time piano player, Nicky Graham. So she became Diane Graham. But I didn't have those people in America. And I really needed, at this moment in time, to have people in America who could take care of the flights, the trips, the trains, the buses, and everything else. All of it. And it was a lot. And for most people, quite hard to cope with. At any rate, Lee brought in a friend of his, a sometime model, called Sarinda Fox, as blonde as Lee, very sort of brother and sister looking actually, and said, OK, here's someone who can be our secretary. Sarinda for a day in New York was a total, utter, complete disaster. Very sweet, very well-meaning, but completely incapable of managing phones, typewriters, telexes or any of the other essentials <laughs> that we needed and so I said sorry but that won't work find me a real administrative person and Z said let's get cherry now cherry vanilla as we remember was in pork and had other names 
one of which was her real name, Cathy Doherty, a hard-working Irish girl who had, at one time in her relatively short career, been an ad executive on the Coca-Cola account for a major advertising agency. And she was enormously efficient doing the work of six secretaries in one sweep. She could call four people at the same time, put three of them on hold and talk to the other one. She could juggle airlines and railways and buses and all manner of stuff, manage bank accounts, deal with opening bank accounts, deal with the checkbook, stuff that you don't normally find in just one person, but in Cherry, it was all there. And then she could also be absolutely wild. When she wasn't Kathy Doherty or Cherry Vanilla, she was Charlotte Roos. And she was a John Vaccaro, Tony Ingrassia, Theatre of the Ridiculous. She was wildly transgender, although she was primarily a girl, but she would often go with boys, go with girls, and she was wild. But like I said, very efficient. So she became the next component of May Man in America. Now, Sarinda shows up again in San Francisco. By this time, we've moved ahead to the end of 72 or October 72. We've skipped over a period when David and Angela both meet and get enamoured of Sarinda, and that we'll talk about later. It's another story. But this story has Mick Rock being challenged, or commissioned, or basically asked, <laughs> told to make a video for Gene Genie, which we've just released as a single from Aladdin Sane, whilst we are touring America with David and we're in San Francisco. We need a James Dean character played by David and a Marilyn Monroe look-alike. And since we know that we can make a good Marilyn out of Surinder and she's available and she's capable and we know that she films and photographs well and she has some acting skill, no problem. Easier to bring her than start trawling for girls in San Francisco, which we could have done. So she is duly flown from New York to San Francisco and promptly on set as Marilyn to David's James Dean. It's well worth looking at that. You can probably find it these days on YouTube or somewhere. But it's a very nice little promo video that we did and remember, this is way before, this is a decade before you have any kind of music video per se. You don't have anything like um, what became the music video, the MTV and the VH1 and all the others that have since, and of course, way before YouTube. So here we are. We've got this nice little piece of footage and we start putting it out wherever we can. And like I say, it's still out there all these years later. David looks great. Sarin looks great. And we have this marvellous Gene Genie song. This was our single from Aladdin Sane and got us quite a lot of attention. Meanwhile, Lee has been given the task of finding a house in Hollywood for the Stooges, which means Iggy Pop and James Williamson and the Ashtons and a roadie that James had, that's Iggy. The roadie is also called James, which is confusing when you consider we've got a James Williamson on lead guitar, we've got a James Osterberg as lead vocal, and we've got a roadie called James. And when I go to see the house, I meet the roadie, and the roadie has got a revolver and it's yeah, a real old wild west revolver it's not actually an old it's probably a 38 police special or saturday night special they used to be called but the bottom line about revolvers is they tend to be quite light on the trigger 
it's easy to shoot yourself if you don't know what you're doing. I said to Iggy and James the roadie, I'm not keen on you having a gun on the premises. I don't know how competent you are with the gun, but it is a potential hazard. And if you shoot yourself in the foot, you'll be fired. Now, of course, at this point in time, Hollywood was going through quite a bad uh, scare because of the Sharon Tate murders that had happened in 69. And there was still a certain amount of uncertainty, especially in places like the Hollywood Hills, which had these fairly large estates, a lot of them old Hollywood estates. And this was the one that one of these Lee had actually found for the band, where you could get intruders and you had lots of canyons and life could get dangerous. So it wasn't fair to say you can't have a gun, but it was fair to say if you get in trouble with it, then you'll be history. Well, sure enough, sometime a few months later or a few weeks later, actually, the man himself, Iggy, who's taken too much of something, is raving in the garden and the roadie is asleep and thinks it's an intruder and leaps out of bed, grabs his pistol, shoots himself in the foot, literally, and so he gets fired. So that's the, the roadie story. <laughs> now, the other thing that happens in this Hollywood house, Lee learns to swim. He never did learn to swim as a kid, but there's a big pool. And Iggy frequently, because he's taking too many drugs, something which he's not supposed to be doing and which Lee's supposed to be in control of, but he's not, and it's hard. Ultimately, Iggy tends to fall in the pool a lot. And when he does, the band are indifferent and basically ignore the fact that he's floating face down in the pool Lee, of course, panics because his job at the end of the day is to take care of Iggy and he has to climb into the pool, hang on to the side and grab Iggy by whatever bit of him he can grab and drag him out. So this becomes a habit and eventually, of course, Lee learns to swim. So there was a plus upside to this. Meanwhile, Wayne comes to visit. Now, people might ask, why did we put... Iggy and his band and one of our staff members who happened to be a raving queen in a house in Hollywood. And the answer is that it's actually safer for us to have Iggy in a Hollywood house where he can be somewhat controlled than leave him in New York or New Jersey or anywhere on the East Coast where you won't be able to stop him from sneaking out and showing up at Max's or some other location where he'll get plenty of drugs, lots of attention, and ultimately CBS will hear about it and it, they won't be happy. So the object was to try and keep him out of the public view and the public eye, which worked for a few months, worked quite well actually. He wasn't a danger to anybody but himself and possibly Lee, but by and large, he was out of sight, which meant out of mind. Iggy often thought that we just abandoned him in Hollywood, as did Wayne, but we hadn't. We were busy trying to make sure that his first Raw Power album would come out with adequate support from CBS. And adequate support from CBS meant that he wasn't a raving drug addict because that would not get him adequate support from CBS. They were willing and, and actually quite keen to support the album, even though it had gone through multiple remixes because Iggy wanted it to be massively distorted and almost unbearably painful to listen to, whereas CBS and I actually wanted it to be representative of some very good songs and let those songs be heard, not completely overwhelmed by the loudest possible discordant music. That was a big problem. That's something that Iggy didn't fully comprehend or didn't want to. 
It's something that CBS, who really did like the album, at least in some parts of their PR for folk and radio folk, weren't happy with the way the remixes were going. Eventually, they asked me, and I arranged for David to come and remix it in a way that would tone it down, and which also upset Iggy because he felt that he didn't want Bowie remixing his music. And, you know, there's a huge disconnect between artists, whether they're designers, photographers, singers, performers, musicians, and the people who are trying to actually promote and market their material. Because if you're trying to promote and market a singer, you need them to sing. And you need them to sing in a way that appeals to their audience. Whereas singers who don't appeal to their audience or who decline to sing or fail to show up to record or go through any of the other Jim Morrison type behaviors are very hard to promote. You can promote a certain level of misbehavior, but beyond a certain point, it just becomes not something you can promote. To get Iggy into a mainstream space, we needed to promote his songs and his performance and not a lot of the other material. So that was a problem. And that's why they were in Hollywood. And Lee and Iggy and the band never really uh, understood that. It was too complicated in most cases for them to get there. Now, in the midst of all of this, Wayne County came to visit. And whilst he was visiting, one of the Hollywood baby groupies called Sable Star, who was going through the list of people that she needed to sleep with in order to fulfill whatever target she was aiming for, which wasn't really clear. But she discovered Wayne. She'd already discovered Iggy, of course and possibly James Williamson. In any event, she decided that she wanted to sleep with Wayne, having already slept with Iggy, and Wayne declined. He said, I don't sleep with girls. Sable probably um, didn't understand that. But in any event, she ended up going into the bathroom at the house and trying to commit suicide. Um, with a razor, but the razor she tried with was one of those two-track razors that had recently come out where the blade wasn't sufficiently exposed to cut you deep enough to do any real damage so you could nick yourself while shaving, but it wasn't like the old straight razor where you could actually cut your wrists. So, of course, there was instant panic that Sable Star's locked in the bathroom, she's trying to commit suicide, um, and then when they get the bathroom door open and they discover that she's actually got little track cuts on her wrist which aren't even bleeding because they're not deep enough, they say, oh, just ignore her. At which point she decides to take off all her clothes and jump in the pool naked. And she can't swim. And so Lee says to Wayne, go in and get her out because Wayne apparently can swim. And Wayne says, no, let her drown and we'll throw her over the canyon afterwards. So once again, Lee has to get in the pool and drag out Sable. And then they call her sister Coral, who's older. And um, she comes and picks her up and takes her away. So what you've got is a house which is under constant attack by suicidal groupies, raving queens and indifferent band members along with, obviously, suppliers of narcotics, which Lee says he simply couldn't stop them from somehow showing up, whether they showed up in the form of groupies, whether they showed up in some other form, but he never was able to. And as he said, Iggy was way too smart in the ways of getting hold of drugs when he wasn't supposed to. And Lee, and Lee simply was outfoxed, outmaneuvered, and largely 
outclassed by Iggy, who was essentially a world-class junkie. And it is very difficult to control people who are that smart at getting drugs. Marianne Faithful, another artist of mine, was able to check herself into clinics, then set up situations where she could say that a male nurse had tried to assault her and managed to discharge herself from the facility, having collected a bunch of narcotics en route by creating, essentially, a sideshow. And this is often what junkies do, and Iggy did the same kind of thing. He would check himself into rehab and then manage to get a hold of a bunch of drugs and check himself out again. That is part of the problem. Less so today, but in those days people weren't really familiar with it and so they didn't pay as much attention as they should have done. Anyway, that's Lee in Hollywood. We heard Lee describing a few of the incidents that he remembered where he had to deal with circumstances you don't usually find on a normal job description, including wrestling with police and having to smuggle Angie out of Japan. He was actually very good at handling situations that required an unusual skill set, wasn't he? He was quick on his feet. He was. He was good on his feet. Um, and he did manage to avoid total catastrophe most of the time. And in a way, albeit it wasn't a ideal situation, he did keep Iggy out of trouble for long enough for us to get the album out. Once the album was out, of course, Iggy managed to get himself in so much trouble that CBS decided not to make a second album. And that's another story. And it's a great story, and one we'll be hearing shortly. There's some of the fascinating memories about one of the great main man characters who was right in amongst all the action at a really interesting time in rock history, Lee Black Childers. There are some great pieces of memorabilia from Lee's adventures that are part of our archive of main man documents, including articles, telexes, letters, production notes and photographs, a lot of them never seen before, that we're adding to the main man label website each week. It's a great record of a very exciting period in rock history. That's at mainmanlabel.com. And on the website, you can also check out the other episodes in the main man series. In the next episode, Tony pays tribute to another member of the Pork team who played a major part in Main Man's American adventures, Jamie Andrews, who ended up working with DeFreeze until 1985. I'm Des Shaw, and this is a Zinc Media MM Tech production. Thanks for listening. <laughs>